Good evening, class. Okay, first thing I'd like to do tonight is to uh, go over those answers that were due last week. All right, the, that was page one and two. We went over page three because you already had the answers. Uh, all right, so let's start with page one. <clears throat> Okay, on page one, everybody take it out and let's see what we got here. Okay, what is a wet vent? Okay, this is a two inch. Now this is going to be in the definitions. All right, page uh, one, page ninety five. It's a two inch waste pipe that acts as a vent for another fixture on the same floor level. All right, we I don't think we talked about it, but I think common sense would tell you you're not going to be vent. You're not going to be doing a vent for fixtures on different levels, not the same vent. So this would be uh, using a, um, a vent as a waste pipe for another fixture on the same floor. Okay, real quick, let's do a review of you. You have a water closet on the top floor, right? You have a floor below. Now, normally this would need a, a, uh, a dotted line going up here, tying in individual vent. However, a lot of you already do this. Change to red, and I know we've done it in class, but just to refresh it. Okay, that would be your, your vent stack. Okay, jumping over. That's the way it's been. All this red right here. Two inch, two inch. This would be a sink. Now, I don't know that we did a levette or half bath. Remember, levette, half bath, same thing. If this was a half bath, you could do it like this here. And I'm sure most of you have, uh, not most, but some of you have done this. Or more commonly, you would add, this would be either a tub or a shower, and this could be, depending if it's a tub, it would be inch and a half, a shower would be two inch, and this here would be the same length as you can go to a vent, which is five, five feet for inch and a half, six for a two inch, okay? And same with the lab, this could go up out to five feet. So there's a wet vent, and it's two inch. The entire wet vent is two inch. Okay, just a refresher. Number two, what's develop length? And this uh, is also one of the um, definitions, and it is called the measure through the center line of the pipe and fittings. Okay, where this is something we use all the time, this develop length is something we don't use. Good to know what it is, but we don't normally use this. So if we have a pipe like this, something like this. The developed length would be the measure from the center of the pipe, through the center of the pipe. So it would look like this. So if you measure this pipe, you'd measure along that red line, which is the center of the pipe, not, not the inside. If you want to call this the inside or the outside over here, it'd be the center, center line measurement. Okay, next one. Where does the building main drain end? Okay, we've beat this to death. I don't know how many times. I'm sure you're all set with this. However, the building main drain is a big one. You will see it. I guarantee you're going to see this for your license. Just a refresher. You come down and out. The wall is here, something like this. Remember, this isn't to scale, obviously, so don't worry about it. And the building drain, main drain, goes from here. To 
will point 10 feet out. All right, I right, made this scales not the best here, but I think you got the idea. So it'd be 10 feet like that. Okay, 10 feet out from the foundation wall. What starts out there, building sewer, not our concern. Well, it is, we got to tie into it. Uh, or the septic tank. Neither one of those are part of our inspection. Okay, so here's our building drain right here. And uh, I think the, actually the exact question is, where does the building drain end? And the answer is 10 feet outside the interface of the foundation wall right here. Right. So that's that was the question. But really, think of it as part of where's the begin and end. All right. Keep that together. It ends right here or begins right here and ends out here. OK. Uh, let's see. What's the definition of um, the definition of a building drain? All right, this one here is one of the definitions. You can look it up. You should, actually, th th you, sh you should have already looked these up. Um, definitions are all in section three. And it lasts, I, I believe it's about 10 pages long. The building drain is the lowest ho horizontal drain that extends from the base of the stack right here, right? To a terminating point 10 feet outside the interface of the foundation wall. All right. So we actually just answered two questions at once. So we we go from here to here, building drain. Okay, now I suspect that most of you hear the term stack more than you hear, hear the term building drain out in the field, which neither here nor there. All right, this would be the main stack right here. Now a secondary stack would be anything like, say, for the sink, which might come off here and go up and out the roof. Um, I used to go up into the attic, and if I was fairly close to the main stack, I'd tie in. If it was going to be a real big pain, uh, forget it. Or oh, there was something in my way. It was a cathedral ceiling where I couldn't get over to here. Or oh, there was some problem. I'd just go out the roof. But my advice to you is the fewer penetrations of the roof that you make, uh, the better the job. Looks better, right? The fewer pipes sticking out the roof, also the less chance for a leak. Every pipe you put out the roof is another chance for a leak. Now, the cozy collar that some of you guys are using, I don't know how long, how durable they are. My guess is they're pretty good because they're very expensive. But the old flashing, which some of you might be using, the old aluminum with the uh, rubber boot, rubber being uh, neoprene. Now, think about that. It's out in the sun every day getting cooked. I don't think it's going to last a lifetime, 10 or 20 years. I have never been called back on one that, um, that started leaking. I don't know if that was luck or it at least so many years in the future, you know, after I was there that they forgot who did it or the new owners had the house, who knows? But uh, my advice is don't go out the roof more than you have to. Okay. Uh, okay, let's move on. If a master plumber lets his journeyman license lapse, may he work for another master plumber. Now, this one I have personal knowledge of because I did this. When I became a teacher, I let my license go away. My journeyman, I kept my master, which was what I needed to teach school. Either either license, journeyman or master. And those of you who think that you could uh, live with high school kids all day and you want to be a teacher, um, it's actually a pretty good job. You know, if you can work with kids, it's not bad. And you got uh, some retirement, you know, time off and all the rest of it. In any case, um, I did that. And I know I told a story to one of one of you two groups. I believe I told you this year. Um, what happened was one day my boss, the superintendent, who was like a principal because it was the one. For those of you not familiar with Diamond, it's a one school system. So the prince, the superintendent, is in the building. And uh, he called me in and said that um, he actually, in his free time, I guess, he used to go through paperwork and he, he saw a blank space for journeyman license. I guess my my uh, job application. And um, I think I let it go just before I started teaching because I knew I was going to be teaching. In any case, uh, he said, you need a journeyman. I said, no, I don't. I got a master. And uh, he said, uh, look into it. Uh, so I said, I'd look into it. So I did call the state and they said, yep, you know, you let you, you know, the journeyman, you know, was, you know, you let it lapse, which of course I knew. 
and uh, for 14 years. Now, uh, I wasn't working much at the time. I, you know, a little side work here and there, but and some of it, you know, all of it that needed a permit had a permit. And um, of course, I always use my master uh, license for the permits. And uh, the man at the, I was talking to at the state said, um, you don't need, and I told him the story about the, uh, the license. He said, you don't need it. He said, you've got your master license. You're teaching school. You're not working with the tools. You're kind of like a supervisor, supervisory role. Plus, I was in, and on top of that, I was in the classroom. And uh, so I got back to my boss, and I told him, um, I talked to the state. They said, I don't need it. And uh, he didn't want to hear that. So without getting into any of that story, I called the state back. And I said, he's not, he, he's not hearing it. He's, he doesn't want to hear this. I need my journeyman. Now I'm nervous. Don't let this happen to you because you might not be so lucky. Think about that. 14 years, probably some penalties, maybe even some schooling. Who knows? And uh, he went out. His, they, even, they had computers back then. And uh, it was in the 90s, I guess. And he checked it out. He says, how's 150 bucks sound? I said, sounds pretty good. So uh, he sent me the application. I don't think the, uh, maybe like the next day I sent it back with the money, got my license and gave it to my boss. And that was the end of that. So moral to the story, do not let your German license lapse once you get your master's. All right. Even if you're running a business, not work with the tools, keep it right. You don't have to take, uh, what do you call those? Those courses you guys got to take every year to keep your license up. Don't have to take any courses. You do have to take a few master, but not the journeyman, just one. Uh, I think it's a scam. That's my opinion. Why do you need two licenses? Uh, the state claims that with the master, you can run your business. Now, again, with some of you guys, I've talked about this. You can run a business, but you and, and you can work with the tools, and you can have journeyman working for you right? Or one apprentice. Now, the journeyman license allows you to work with the tools. It doesn't make any sense to me because you already had the journeyman license. But they claim to work with the tools, you need a journeyman. To run the business, you need the master. So you need both. Okay. They get two fees. Let's face it. That's what I, I think that's about. In any case, technically, let's say you're pulling permits with a master. And I never heard this happen. And something goes wrong, goes very wrong. Um, and somebody's looking for an out, you know, either insurance not to pay, the state to blame somebody. Um, you don't have a journeyman license. You're technically in writing, according to our code, not able to work with the tools if you don't have a journeyman. Okay. So a master's is not good enough. So remember that. Once you get your journeyman and then you get your master, which I recommend to everybody. I don't care if you land a nice job, your boss owns a company and you're going to be a foreman and you can be a journeyman and be a foreman. That's fine. Because tomorrow might change. All of a sudden the job's gone and you're stuck. You're 40 years old and you're only a journeyman. Okay, you got to go back to school. You got to take night school courses. I mean, I've had plenty of guys in class that were 40 years old going for that journeyman. Never mind going for their master's. So uh, my advice is to do what a lot of guys did, and I did it too. As soon as you get your journeyman, just stay in school, just keep just keep on going and get that that masters and put it away. But also keep the journeyman, all right? All right. Uh, let's go from there. Can a, if a master lets his journeyman lapse, can he work for another master plumber? Okay, so one master can work for another master if he wants to. I don't know what he's going to do because he can't work with the tools. He can run the business for the guy. But uh, does it, that doesn't make much sense. But legally, yes, he can work for another master. So the short answer is yes. And then it says here also, not with the tools. If a master plumber lets his journeyman plumber's license, can he run a business? And here again, another way to phrase it. So you do what I did. Let your journeyman run out. Yes, I can run the business, but I can't run, I can't work with the tools. Can a journeyman plumber have his own business? Yes. I think you all know this, but just refresh your memory. A journeyman plumber can have his own business in Massachusetts, not in Rhode Island, 
For those of you who want to get both licenses, remember that journeyman doesn't work in Rhode Island running a business. So you get, you can get a license and run your own business, but you can, oh, the next question, can a journeyman hire another journeyman? No. Surprise. Two journeymen technically can't work together. Now, I have never heard of this um, getting to the point where it was a big problem. But again, if something goes very wrong, you burn down a house, somebody gets injured, killed, whatever, because of your actions or inactions, whatever, you know, you burn a place down and there's a major investigation and any of this stuff pops up. Don't think for a minute they're not going to use it, whether it's insurance, state, who knows what. So remember these rules. Two journeymen cannot work together legally. Yes, I know one could pull a permit. The other guy gets lost at the time of the inspection. That's all well and good, but until something goes wrong. Also the insurance. Uh, can a journeyman plumber hire one apprentice for himself? Legally, no. Can a journeyman plumber take out a permit? Yes. Now, I think this was, you know, I came in on the scene officially. I mean, as a kid, I worked with my father back in, in the 60s, I guess. I know I did. And uh, But when I started, when I, as soon as I got out of the Army, well, right, not long after I got out of the Army, I started going to night school and so on. And by that time, in the uh, early 70s, a uh, journeyman uh, could take out a permit, just like today. But at some point before that, I believe it was my night school instructor, uh, told us that there was a time where it was like Rhode Island, where a journeyman couldn't run a business. And it was a big commotion. The journeyman didn't like it. And the masters didn't think they should get a permit because let them go and get their masters so they can run a business. So they made a compromise. The compromise is that a journeyman could pull a permit to do the job, but he's got to work alone. And as every one of you know, even when you're 25 years old, there's some jobs that are just um, almost impossible to do alone, right? They're very hard to do. So the uh, short answer is for that, that's, yes, a journeyman can run a business and he can pull a permit. He just can't uh, hire anybody legally. Okay. Can a journeyman do gas work? Yes. Um, this one here, I did look up myself. It's uh, page 12, section 302. This is at the very beginning of the book, which we don't use that much. I always start on page, I believe it's 81 with that uh, index. And I think that's the one I told you to add the page numbers. You can find the page numbers at the very beginning of the book. Why they don't have the page numbers listed on page 81. They got the sections, which are like chapters. I don't know. Put your own page numbers in there on that page. But anyway, you go back to page 12. Uh, the It does say the journeyman can do gas work. So whatever journeyman or master can do plumbing, you can do for gas. All right. They're kind of interchangeable like that. And uh, when we do gas, I think we'll have time later today. Uh, when we do gas, um, I'll mention to you about, uh, about the licenses and um, what you can do because the gas... Uh, allows you to do pretty much what you can do in plumbing, except it's for gas. You can also, I think you're all aware of this, or you should be, uh, gas usually think for plumbing, we usually do probably more than 90% of our time is spent doing natural gas. We really get involved with propane. Propane guys take care of that, right? Now, it's not in the book anywhere, but the propane guys, they have a gas license, which allows them to do natural gas and propane, but they can't do plumbing. It's a totally separate license, okay? And uh, in fact, at uh, Diamond, we had a uh, night school. We did have, a, occasionally we'd run a gas program. Uh, and it was usually for the gas company employees. It usually wasn't like a, a random group of guys like, like plumbing where you got 15 different guys, you got 15 different companies represented there. With gas, it was like, 10 guys and one company, a gas company, maybe, maybe one or two guys, but it was almost always gas company employees that were taking that. Um, and I guess occasionally a propane guy. I did, a, I did maybe one or two uh, of those programs, not many. They didn't run as many, but in any case, um, a journeyman gas, uh, fitter can, can, uh, work with the tools 
and do the work, but again, has to work alone, right? No apprentice. What is a vacuum? Okay, we're leaving the licenses here. We're going to something different. What's a vacuum valve and where is it used? Okay, we're back on plumbing here. Okay, a vacuum valve is a non, this is non-pressure. This is page 84 uh, under, uh, this is under definitions. Anti-siphon non-pressure type valve, not used under continuous pressure. Uh, this would, an example would be on a water closet, a urinal, a bidet, bathtub, and a spout below the rim. Okay, when they say a bathtub, now most of you I think are familiar with that. Uh, anybody here has done commercial, you know that you got one built into the uh, the flush valve, right? And the bidet, you got one. Now, the bathtub's a little different. The bathtub is really only when you have a tub, like on, um, with the spout below the rim. That's, that's one type. So you got an old tub on legs, and you know how the spout comes out maybe six inches down from the top. The little tiny little faucets. Well, in theory, if the water filled up in the tub, the water could siphon and the faucet was open. Let's say it was in the country and it was a well, pressure goes, the uh, power goes off. In theory, the water could siphon into the piping system. It's a one in a, I don't know, we'll say a thousand, but it could happen. And obviously we don't want the bath water, which is not exactly crystal clear after somebody, somebody's used it back into the system so that's why we have to have all our faucets now above the top two pipe diameters now i know i did that with a group so let me if it wasn't your group let's take a look okay so they say it's about below the rim so let's do that if you got a spot below the rim like this and the shut off the old ones were actually right there like that okay the water could siphon if the water went up higher than this here it could go into the faucet and cause problems so what they say we have to do is to go higher than the faucet the excuse me higher than the tub which you do right these days this would be a fiberglass tub right spout is here and it's two pipe diameters so i'm blowing this up here if the spout was like this that's what i'm trying to show right here two pipe diameters so if this was like a even though unless it's a very old tub they're rectangular but if you took the diameter of that if it was say inch and a half this would be inch and a half inch and a half this would be three inches up. And I think most of you go probably four inches up. So it's not a problem, right? This would be the rim of the tub right here. Okay. Now I have seen tubs and probably you have too. Some of them very fancy tubs. Uh, they were around years ago when I was in business and they had a spout below the rim like this. Now the old days that was okay. Today, you have to put a vacuum breaker like on the back wall. This wouldn't be fiberglass. This would be a drop-in tub. This one of those fancy, uh, could be cast iron. I guess these days they're probably mostly plastic. And this would drop into a platform, almost like a, uh, a vanity, like a vanity on the floor for the tub. Drop your tub in, seal it up all the way around. And uh, on the wall over here, you would have a vacuum breaker. So the water piping, I, I don't even want to attempt to draw it. Just picture it. The water piping would come up and instead of going into the valve here, it would, it would go by this, over to this, in the wall, into here, then back, and then over to the valve. All right, so after the water goes to the valve, before it comes out the spout, it detours through the vacuum break. That way, should the water get up to here, it can't go into the system because there's a vacuum breaker above the flood level room. Okay, now I, I might have installed... Oh, I don't know, three or four of those over a number of years that I was on the trade. And I'm sure that if, uh, I'm sure they're still using these tubs, uh, some of you guys maybe can add to that. So do me a favor. Anybody who's done one of these, I am sure you've done it more recently than I have, uh, I'd like to share your experience with this here, with the vacuum breaker on the, probably on the back wall. 
only because it'll be out of the way. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Also, remember these fancy tubs like this. No, this is this is just a regular fiberglass tub. This is a fancy tub dropped in with a big spout. A lot of times the spout, if it doesn't come through here, it comes in like this. They call it a Roman spout. This would be the platform like that. The tub is, this is a cutaway, really. And uh, there's a big Roman spout, they call it, like this. Very big, fancy, probably worth about 200 bucks. And uh, it's legal because it's high enough above the water. The flood level where mine's, <laughs> mine's sagging down a bit here. But that part's legal. But because there's no shower, you can have the two handles. Right? As soon as you put a shower on here, you have to have a single handle. And some of them, what we used to do is put the single handle, like a Simmons, right here on this wall in the back with a handheld, hooked directly to a handheld, where this one had these big fancy faucets right here, great big faucets, maybe with uh, levers or some kind of big bulky um, handles on it. All right, so... Uh, this here would naturally be two pipe diameters right here, of course. And you, But you could have the two handles as long as this was not connected to a shower head. All right, but if this was below the water level, like where I had it, then you needed the uh, vacuum relief valve. Okay, how would you describe an air brake? Okay, this is back to the definitions. This is number 14. It's a drain that discharges directly into a sink at a point below the flood level rim of the sink. Example, a clothes washer. All right, there's an S missing there. Oh, you don't have this. This is on my, my uh, printed copy here. Uh, it discharges directly into a sink at a point below the flood level rim. That's an air break. Now, again, we've gone over this in class. I don't think I did this with tier one. I'm not sure. Rusty on it now, but let's, let's take a look. Good chance for uh, this would be an indirect. Now, this is more than what they're asking for. Okay, it's an air brake called an indirect drain. Indirect drain. This would be a point below the flood level rim. The word I want you to highlight there is below. So you have a pipe. We're going to use a clothes washer pipe because this is the easiest and most common by far. Stand pipe, remember that? 18 to 30. 18 to 24, that's the uh, your uh, vent through the roof. All right, so we got a standpipe. Now, the definition is that the drain comes in at a point below the flood level. Okay? Below the flood level. Hold on. So let's do this. We're going to take a clothes washer next door to it, and we're going to take the hose and put the hose inside here. Hose is a little smaller, probably one inch diameter hose, and it goes in like this, all right? We low flood level rim right here, right there. All right, now another thing I've told you guys, and I, know, I think I've said it this year, uh, let's say you're putting in a um, clothes wash hookup for, you got an elderly customer, and uh, they got the new dishwasher, excuse me, new clothes washer was delivered, and there it is. And the hose is on it, and it's all ready to go. All you got to do is plug it in. Obviously, you need a plug right there where this is. And uh, you got to hook up your, your hoses, and the hoses are right there too. And uh, so what do you do? You got some 85-year-old customer. All right, you got to be a nice guy. You can hook it up. So you hook the hoses. It takes like all of uh, five minutes. You hook up the hoses, and you take the drain hose right and you stick it in here but you don't stick it in too good not deep enough you don't secure it now i think you might know where this is going when this pump comes on for this here what happens it it jumps right 
the force of the water will cause this thing to kick up a little bit. Now, be sure that you don't have it just a little bit in here, you know, just slightly in here because the hose could pop out and your goodwill, your good deed goes uh, not, not really appreciated because you just flooded the place. All right. So be sure if you ever hook this in your own house or somebody else's, make sure that this is secure and test it, that it can't jump out. All right. Whether you got to tape it down, uh, do something. Be sure that this can, there's no way that this can jump out. Also, remember this, if you're putting this in, this should be supported. Clip to the wall. Here's what I'd suggest. If you're going to get down and dirty and put in your clothes washer connection, which is all you need to do legally, you're not doing one of those fancy boxes in the wall where they're going to be in a little closet with bifold doors. It's just down in the basement and you got to hook it up. You put your uh, hot and cold, uh, cheap as you could go, a couple of uh, boiler drains with um, with a standpipe like this here. Okay, clip it to the wall. What do you do? Get a piece of plywood, ideally maybe three-quarter plywood, at least half-inch plywood. Shoot it to the wall. with. You should have uh, like a Hilti gun or a cheap version of it, the kind here with a hammer. Shoot some 22s into the, the nails with the 22s into the wall and clip this on the wall inch and a half clips, like gas pipe clips are fine. You know, like maybe one up and one down. This should be nice and tight to the wall because this is going to be pulling on it, right? And your water pipes, obviously, you should, uh, what would that be, a couple of drop your 90s, okay, with uh, your, your half-inch uh, boiler drains on there. Those are fine. All right. Okay. Let's uh, get bogged down on that one. Now, the next thing, uh, they mentioned a point below the flood level rim. Now, this is not a question, but only because I did this half. Let's do the other half. Not a question, but this uh, little quiz sheet. The other one is called an air break, uh, excuse me, air gap. Okay, now the air gap uh, would be the top. The top we just did. This would be uh, below flood level rim. Right, the connection below flood level, right? And this one is above. This one is a better one, but you can't always do it. All right, let's go back to the tub again. Okay, and here's the wall. All right, so the air gap is above. It connects above right here. In this case, it was the two pipe dam, as I told you about. All right, so that's an example of an air gap. So these two make up an indirect drain. Now, those are just two examples of them. All right. Now, I think we're shifting gears again, getting away from this, this drainage stuff. We have... Um, oh, I see. They go into existing work, and then a couple of questions later, they come back to the air gap, which we just did. All right, the next question was, what do you consider to be existing work? Okay, this is a little tricky. Now, obviously, I've been around for a while, so a lot of, not a lot, but there's some stuff that was done when I first started that not being done anymore. Not much. By the time I came along, the code was pretty tight. A lot of grandfathered stuff, two-handle shower valves, no uh, backflow preventer on a boiler, things like that. That had already been resolved and factored into the code long ago. But what the definition of existing work is, it's a plumbing system or any part thereof installed prior to the effective date of this code is grandfathered. And uh, page 88 in definitions. Okay, um, so what they're saying there is if something was legal, like the tub on legs, the old, what they call an Essex tub, they were from the early part of the 20th century, like 1900. I had one in my own house. It was, and if you turn them upside down, sometimes you can see the date on it. It's actually stamped. Mine was uh, 1903. It was in great condition. I got it from an antique store. Anyway, and it had the holes for the, uh, the shutoff, those little tiny handle shutoffs that some of you have seen, and it was below flood level rim. Well, that's okay. You can repair it. 
but you can't replace it. As soon as you replace that faucet, you're going to have to make it legal. Now, legally, what they have is a big gooseneck that, you know, that uh, the handles are, uh, let me see, it hooks up through the holes, but then it goes up and then comes over. Almost looks like a lab sink. And uh, if you remember in like in science lab when you were a kid in school, those big gooseneck faucets near the air gap right there. So that's how you can make it legal. Very expensive faucet. Some of you might have seen it. Again, if you uh, anybody's done one lately, let's talk about it. Okay, so that is an example of existing work. So you can, again, also the uh, two-handle shower valve, actually the three-handle, sometimes the third handle in the middle is for the diverter, tub, shower. Now those, same thing. You can repair them. Seat, uh, washer, that's it. As soon as you try to change that, change it out for a, a newer version, it's an illegal uh, faucet, okay? You're going to have to... Um, take those that three those three holes that are above the tub maybe a foot foot and a half above the tub rim and they sell uh, a big plate that covers it. i guess you, i think some guys call it a goof plate and it has a, a single handle it's set up for a single handle valve in the middle and that plate that goes out on the sides covers those two holes you don't need all right so that's one way around that some of you guys might have used it again when we go live you can anybody's done that let's talk about it uh, that would be considered grandfathered. So remember, anything that's grandfathered had to be legal at the time it went in. Now, if something was like really awful, like uh, some genius hooked up a, a water heater or a boiler, or even worse, with no smoke pipe on it, it's like, um, that's not grandfathered. That's just crazy. I mean, that's crazy then, it's crazy now. Uh, and never do this. Never walk away from something... It could be a hazard. Now, if somebody's cheap, doesn't want to fix uh, something that looks like it's going to let go, uh, that's their business. If it's flat out a hazard, I would actually tell the inspector. Is I normally don't get, you know, ratting out customers. Not doesn't you know ain't going to make it very popular. But if it's something that's just flat out dangerous and they don't want to correct it, I once I was done with that job, I would just let the inspector know. Or if the inspector came to the job because it was big enough for an inspection. Um, I'd make sure that he was aware of it. Um, and the way you would handle that is you could tell the customer diplomatically, yeah, you better, I'm doing this, but we better take care of that because one is dangerous. And two, when the inspector comes here, he's pretty sharp. He's going to see that and you got to fix it anyway. So let's, let's get ahead of it. And if that doesn't work, when the inspector comes, I'm sure he'll see. And if he doesn't, I'm sure you can help him, help him find it. Okay. Uh, air gap, we did unobstructed vertical okay this is my favorite definition of, in the book uh, some lawyer wrote this one the unobstructed vertical distance through the free atmosphere from the outlet of the spigot to the full level rim of the sink okay that's a lot of words to say that we're where the uh, pipe ends like the spout for the tub and the top of the tub there's a little bit of space there so this water can't get back up that's it so they said it with all that all that language there was just to say that uh, one pipe empties above the, the drain or the uh, flood level room. Okay, the laying length of pipe. It's the length of the pipe, not counting the hub. Okay. To me, not a very important one, but let's take a look. Let's do some cast iron. This is supposed to be a piece of four inch cast iron with a hub. All right. And what they're saying is leave the hub out. Now, did I ever measure one of these? No, but I think it's a five foot piece. I believe according to this definition is this. All right. So, and any of you guys that still work with uh, hub and spigot cast iron, um, this is what the laying length is. Don't count the hub. That's the word. So the hub right here, we don't count. That's laying length. How much larger is the building sewer than the main drain, the building drain? Now this is tricky. So you guys that have done a lot of houses or a number of houses in the country, not so much in the, in the, I mean, in the, uh, in the city or in a 
suburban setting, Somerset is one, Swansea is not, where they have city sewers, right, or town sewers, uh, you get into this quite often. So you go from a four inch pipe like this, right? This is your building drain and the drain layer runs six inch this way and you tie into it, All right? Look familiar? Okay. And what's here? You got your donut. You got that four by six O-ring goes around the pipe like that. Okay. Seals it up. So this is a six. And this is a four. Okay. Unless it was a very big building where you're working with, once you get something beyond this scale, you're going to be working with some very tight prints anyway. So you don't have to worry about being too creative or imaginative because that'll all be taken care of for you. But when you're, you know, doing small buildings where it's your decision, this is automatically a four, your building drain under the wall, 10 feet, and it switches over 10 feet outside the interface of the wall. Okay. What the book says is that this can be a five. It doesn't have to be a six. It's like the inch and a quarter vent, something we never use, but this has to be one size larger. Okay. So this is one of those exceptions that you have to just learn. Don't think of your experience like this, because that's going to get you the wrong answer. This is the right answer. I've never seen that, by the way. I have no idea how to seal that up. What would you use to seal that? Half inch all the way around the pipe? I don't know. Oakum? I'm not sure. Okay. But that is the, um, well, they say one size larger, all right, which makes it five inch. Okay. I did not, I suspect that I'm running a little overtime here. I forgot to write down the starting time. So I'm going to stop here and we're going to pick up on the other side and, um, Move on.